get started. Uh, so thank you, uh, yeah, Yune, and um, uh, nice review for the Q and A's. So today uh, we will go over to the, the next part of this uh, visualizing neural structures. Uh, there are a number of things we will be uh, covering. So first is we want to uh, study methods for visualizing, not just uh, morphology, but the gene and protein expression. And also how to utilize the neural circuitry and connections between different brain regions. So uh, the specific content of techniques we will be covering is our first insight to hybridization. Insight to means things happening in place, okay? and immunohistochemistry and uh, enzymatic histochemistry and reporter genes. And lastly, sorry, this is type of fourth is visualizing circuitry that we will be discussing about the concept of enterograde and retrograde uh, tracers and transsynaptic tracers. So one, one terminology which I use uh, last uh, time was a juxta cellular labeling. That juxta actually means uh, from Latin uh, near to. So it's kind of uh, the probe is uh, or near to the cell, almost touching to the cell. All right, let's discuss about visualizing gene and protein expression. So the questions we are asking is how to classify a cell within the brain. So brain is a complicated organ with a lot of different types of subregions and cell types even. So the morphology is a key, okay? And the location in the brain. And also what determines uh, each single cell's functionality or types are really depends on that gene and protein expression profiling, okay? So what does the gene expression by a neuron uh, determine. So this is about, um, let me see uh, who will be. So uh, Min Song. So this would be some of the questions. So gene expression, uh, how, how does it determine, how is it determined by a neuron? So that gene expression will be uh, in, in the brain. What kind of characteristics are we talking about? Functional. Exactly, yeah. Uh, then it could be excitatory or inhibitory. Exactly, yes. One is activating, the other is a suppression of our activity. And that is related to the kind of neural curves it releases and responds to. Maybe you can guess what that is. Neurotransmitters. Exactly. Yes, there are excitatory neurotransmitters like glutamate or inhibitory neurotransmitters such as GABA. So uh, these are like uh, important aspects and we want to visualize that. So, so first technique I want to discuss is insight to hybridization. So those who, are, uh, who, who learned molecular biology or medical engineering in last semester, or uh, remember what the hybridization is, okay? So in this um, brain section, we want to see gene expression. So when we say gene expression, it could mean that transcribed RNA or mRNA, or sometimes the final product of gene expression is a protein. So normally we call both of these as a gene expression profile. Especially in this case, uh, you will see that we are interested in transcribed mRNA, uh, which has a single-stranded uh, like A, U, G, C uh, sequences. So I want to detect this mRNA in a brain, let's say slice uh, like section. And how do I detect this? So a good way is we know that you know, DNA or DNA RNA hybridization would be a good way. So there are complementary tagged protein uh, that will be um, forming a hybridization and so that we can detect if we, the tag contains a contract. 
So one example is this figure you can see in this um, uh, brain section, you can actually see this dark pigment, which will reveal the spatial distribution of this gene expression. Also, depending on the timing of this sacrifice, you, can, you may also check out the temporal aspect. Okay, so this in situ hybridization um, shows where a gene is expressed, okay, uh, with a colorimetric reaction. So in situ hybridization is to visualize the expression of nucleic acids. In this case, uh, I already said mRNA in tissue slides, okay? So, in, so this is to determine uh, when, because it re by the time you are actually uh, sacrificing and forming the sample, that timing also can be reflected. So we can determine when and where you can see the spatial of the specific gene is expressed in the nervous system and in this, for example, brain section. So how can we do? It requires identifying the genetic sequence of mRNA to be studied. So then you can actually see this. So, so this I will, uh, I already discussed this. Uh, let's see a uh, shoe claw. Uh, so inside to hybridization needs a, you know, single or double-stranded nucleic acid pro with a complementary base pair sequence. We call this as an anti-sense. Shukla, can you guess what this is? Either double or single? Single. Yes, exactly, because it has to, you know, uh, form a hybridization. And this probe can be very, very uh, sensitive. So the probe is packed with either a radioactive nucleotide, which is very sensitive, but it's radio. Um, active or other molecules such as of fluorescence for detection. Then uh, let's think about how we can design this experiment, a practical aspect. So we have to think uh, uh, control experiments, okay, for this inside to hybridization. There are like, when we say control, uh, there are uh, negative or positive control. Uh, so, so let's think of this. Because this is, um, uh, we need this, a probe, or some probe with the same sequence of the gene of interest. So think about, you, we have an mRNA sequence of interest. So we have a complementary to actually attach hybrid But uh, who knows, our probe uh, is, when we make a probe, like just there could be some other aspects, non-specific binding on those. So we, divides a negative control, which means it's not supposed to work. So Shukla, can you guess what kind of probe, which it means the same sequence of the gene of interest, then it will not be, uh, because it's the same, it will not form hybridization. So that's a negative control. Can you guess what this is? Yes, this is called a fence probe. So I said anti-sense, which is a complementary sequence. If it's the same sequence, it's a sense. So it's called sense pro. And another control uh, we can also consider is so that hybridized to a different region of the same mRNA. So what it means is we have an mRNA sequence uh, of a gene of interest, but you know there are it's, it's long, so we can have a pro for this. But another way, we don't know whether this will make a, a like almost perfect. So another reason of interest, we can also put the anti-sense probe. Okay, so that's an additional control. So Shukla, can you guess this? Anti-sense. Exactly. So anti-sense. So this makes sure that our experiment is done right. So this is more of a practical aspect. So now I'm gonna talk about the FISH, it stands for fluorescent in situ hybridization. Okay, this is for more like we get inside the cell, uh, cell nucleus, uh, more inside the chromosome, okay? So this refers a technique that are used to examine location of DNA 
within the chromosome, okay? Uh, previously, ISH, site hybridization, is more like uh, tissue level. So this is a little smaller uh, level to visualize chromosomal abnormalities, such as, you know, like from the uh, chromosome DNA mutation, missing or dislocation of gen genetic segments. So I bring an uh, example figure over here. So this is the picture of fish fluorescent in cytohybridization. So this is an example that we have a, this metaphase cell. So what you, you are seeing here is uh, this blue ones are chromosomes. And uh, there are red and there are green genes. So this is uh, an example picture called the BCR able uh, the genes, but because of a, some of the disease which is caused by this uh, chromosomal rearrangement, they actually come here put together, which means an abnormal fusion protein was made, and this can lead to a genetic uh, diagnosis of someone who are suffering from, in this case, CML or chronic myelogenous leukemia. So fish is a, a technique which can even detect this uh, chromosomal um, mutational uh, event. Okay, so the detail, uh, this is reference, so I'm gonna move on, but this is very, very sensitive in that aspect. All right, so now we will be talking about immunohistochemistry. This IHC is a technique which is not only in neuroscience, but more, it can be more general. Right, such as general biology or tumor biology, um, many, many developmental biology. So this is a general technique. So uh, those who are not familiar with this, I think this is a time to understand this. So why we, the name stands for immuno. So we are talking about antigen antibody interaction, okay, immunology. And histo stands for the structure of the tissue, okay? And chemistry, chemistries are involved. So first, there are proteins of our interest we want to detect. Then uh, the best uh, agent for that is the antibody, which has an exquisite specificity for this protein. And that primary antibody can have, you know, a uh, contrast agent. Without contrast, we cannot detect. But um, this may not be effective enough in, in many cases, in fact. So you devise a amplification uh, uh, strategy for this signal, because you see there are only like two, two stars here, which may be too dim compared to noise. So another aspect is you design another kind of antibody, which is specific to bind to the primary antibody. Then what can happen is, you can have a multiple secondary antibody attached to primary antibody so that you can have more contrasts, uh, more um, tags can be available, which makes it signal amplification for detection purpose. So this is very typical. So for example, but in practice, you think about this, let's say you are interested in human brain section, human protein, then, um, you could develop a antibody from another uh, organism such as a rabbit. So this is rabbit antibody against human, let's say, human protein A. Uh, then, you know, this rabbit antibody, you can also make uh, antibody from, let's say, uh, goat. So goat antibody against rabbit. So you can make this, and this way we can amplify. These antibodies are usually pretty expensive. So it's expensive technique, but it's very specific. All right, so here's an example. So typically these uh, contrast probes are showing up uh, brown pigment. So these brownish colors are usually uh, used in the immunohistochemistry that the uh, expected proteins are distributed here, the presence or especially in space. So immunohistochemistry is a process of selectively detecting signals. A, uh, let's see. Jui? Oh, 
Exactly. Yeah. Protein in cells of twisted pectin within with antibodies. Immuno means use of antibody to recognize and bind to specific proteins and this the tissue. And sometimes we call this immunocytochemistry. The cyto stands for cells. So when we are more emphasizing the cellular aspect, or you will hear a lot about in literature or uh, immunofluorescence, because uh, when we use, in this case, these are not fluorescence though. Uh, sometimes we use fluorescence then you have a black background, dark background, and fluorescence can be very specific or even multiple colors are possible. So immunofluorescence when we are using fluorescent reagents. So, so to name, to explain the previous slides are uh, that we can call direct and indirect immunistic chemistry. Zui again can, so primary, like the primary antibodies are conjugated directly with a fluorescent molecule or chromogenic enzyme. The previous slide, you see this dark brown pigmentation, that's a chromogenic, okay? Uh, that's made out chromogenic enzyme. Then indirect one, uh, Zui again, this is, uh, Exactly. We add a secondary antibody, which is conjugated for detection, then this will amplify. So that recognized primary antibody for signal, um, G. Amplification. Exactly. So you want to, this is very important in, in practice, because you want to have amplified the signal. And so even immunohistochemistry, what I'm talking about is in practice, uh, this is people say more of an art, okay? Because it's it's all different from case by case. So experience and trial and errors are important, but you have to be uh, thinking how to perform this experiment. Especially controls are very important, okay? Because antibody batches can be different from company to company, and the concentration can be uh, optimal concentration. Uh, yeah, you may have to decide those. So then you have to also think of how do I control so that you make sure what your experimental results are, are proper. So first is the, um, uh, think about specimen known to contain the antigen of interest. Then when you put the antibody, you know that antigen must be there. Then you know the binding will occur. So this must occur, we call it as a positive control, uh, showing that, hey, the antibody batch, what you are using is actually working first, okay? On the other hand, if another aspect, but the antibody has to be specific, it, it should not bind to any, uh, everything or any other things than what you are intended to uh, specify. So for that, you, divides a specimen, a sample, which should not contain the antigen of interest to make sure the specificity of your antibody. So this we call it as, because they will not bind. So this is supposed to be not working. So we devise negative control experiment. So this way you ensure that what your results uh, is actually properly obtained. So, how do we do this control experiment? So first, we have to make sure the primary antibody and the secondary antibody are, right? So first, primary antibody specificity is very important. Then you could pre-incubate primary antibody with a known solution of its antigen. So this is like positive control, right? Then you mix them, you form antibody antigen, complexes and supposedly there are enough of antigens around, you will not have any free antibodies remaining to bind the sample, okay? So this is a uh, positive control. And the other is a control in indirect immunohistic chemistry. So when you do indirect, which requires a secondary antibody, uh, then you want your secondary antibody not bind to anything else except the primary antibody, all right? So you want to test non-specific binding of the labeled secondary antibody. This is important because 
you know, what happens is when you put secondary antibody, if there's no primary antibody there, but somehow secondary antibody can bind to some specific area of the brain and you can have a wrong conclusion. So you have to make sure this, how we have, you can incubate the specimen with, you know, originally direct uh, primary antibody and secondary antibody, you can divide, hey, let's remove primary antibody and make sure the secondary antibody do not bind to a specific region. So this incubate only secondary antibody without primary antibody to see the final results. So hopefully this makes sure when you are considering of these experiments. So in practice, uh, there, are, there needs a lot of optimization so how to fix uh, methods of fixation. For example, when you have to fix the, uh, the let's say brain using um, a 4% powerful maldeh, the timing is an issue. Sometimes I hear that over fixation, okay, may interfere with the antibody binding. So there are a little optimal uh, ways of fixation. So over fixation is not, necessarily good thing. Okay, of course, under fixation is even worse, I guess. And also antibody concentration and how long do you have to incubate this antibody for this proper binding? So in the end, each antibody you buy and use should be optimized for experiment the condition before immunohistochemistry on if you have multiple samples which you will be needed for your experiment. Okay, so the next is in enzymatic histochemistry. So, Sung uh, Young. So, enzyme is a biomolecule capable of catalyzing a biological reaction. Sung Young, can you guess what this is? Catalyzing. Exactly, yes. Enzyme is a catalyzing reaction. So, using enzymatic histochemistry means a method to detect the enzymes based on the enzyme's endogenous activity to create a visible reaction product. So the reaction product will give us a contrast. So how do we use it? Incubate brain section in a solution containing a chromogenic chemical, which serves as a, uh, again, S for the enzyme. Sub? Substrate. Exactly, very good, yeah. So enzyme needs a substrate to react, okay? Uh, so in the end, this one will generate chromogenic chemical so that we can generate a color. So for example, I have here cytochrome oxidase to visualize metabolically active neurons. Uh, an example is rodon better cortex, which is uh, uh, many times used in neuroscience for somatosensory uh, uh, circuit. So here I, I brought a picture for that. And you know, uh, rodents has a whisker, okay? And that's very important because they are uh, living in a dark place usually, okay? So their whiskers are very important. And interestingly, this organization of whisker, we actually make a anatomic location and and this is A, B, C, D, E. There are a number of whiskers. Very interestingly, in this somatosensory cortex, that is in fact in the called the better cortex, it actually maps exactly similar organization here. Okay, so I, how to find this uh, people? As I said before, uh, enzymatic chemistry can help because they have a, we can use uh, site from oxidase and that activity, if you have this brain cortex and then you do this uh, state, what you can see is uh, this beautiful uh, two-dimensional organization of uh, this better cortex, which is one-to-one -one correspond to the actual uh, whiskers, okay? So you can have a 2D naming, A, B, C, D, E as a row, one, two, three, four, five, as a column so that you can identify which whisker to which. Let me tell you one, uh, like this is a, uh, you know, like 
uh, you have to do immunohistochemistry, but you can do this in vivo experiment. For example, you can touch using uh, piezo, you can touch, let's say only let's D1, one whisker you can touch, and then you will do a functional imaging and on the cortex, you can actually find D1 is uh, activated. So this is possible. So it's, it's kind of a uh, very interesting experiment you can do. And another, uh, this is a reference only though. Uh, I want to show, talk about Cree locks and cell specific promoters uh, to target gene expression, space and temporary. So this is a little more advanced technique that Cree locks is a uh, genetic manipulation that you put uh, so-called locks P site into uh, this sequence. And you can see here locks P, locks P prime, and M cherry is a one kind of fluorescence, uh, such as like green fluorescent protein. This is cherry color. While you see this is flipped. So then this animal contains uh, these, uh, 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 you inject this virus, but then uh, this specific cell to uptake this virus, uh, or if there is a Cree recombinase enzymes getting in, they will like cut this and then flip. So put this M cherry back. So, and this will make sure the specificity of the neuron. So you can see this uh, nice uh, spatial uh, uh, gene expression, a targeted gene expression, you can see. So this become a this, okay? So this is a, just an example that Cre is expressed in nesting positive neural progenitor cell. So that you need a Cre recombinate in this specific cells so that uh, the virus infected here and that only these cells will be able to express M cherry fluorescent signal. So that expression is only for granule neurons, which is born after the virus injection. So this is a, a, a technique you can actually see how powerful this technique is. So with that, I want to talk about reporter genes. So this also is not only limited to neuroscience, but more of a, a general uh, biology as well. So the name stands for why reporter to examine spatial and temporal expression of a gene of interest by measuring the expression of a, we'll talk about reporter. So reporter is not the gene of your interest, but you somehow put the reporter like to uh, link to the, the gene of interest, but gene of interest you cannot see directly. So instead you watch the reporter so you can estimate how the original gene expression is. So what's the reporter gene? In that aspect, reporter is an endogenous gene or non-endogenous gene? So reporter is, we make it, so it's a non-endogenous gene encoding an enzyme or fluorescent protein whose expression is controlled by a uh, Yamuna? Promoter. The model for a separate gene of interest. This is your gene of interest. Okay, so here's a general procedure to study expression of gene X. Uh, we can create, you can create reporter construct by using recombinant DNA technology. Sometimes you buy, okay, in which the reporter gene is placed under the control of the prot promoter for the gene X, which is your interest. Uh, so Reporter is a, a way to give us a contract. So there are, for example, fluorescent reporters such as GFP and it's a derivative for the red fluorescent protein. We just saw M cherry and many, many other like Venus, many types of other colors as well. Or more traditionally, there are locked Z uh, gene which encodes beta galactosidase so that you can create a pigment, a blue pigment. Or sometimes we also use uh, luciferase. Uh, luciferase is a, uh, we call bioluminescence, which means it's a, a living uh, light coming out, a living thing. So uh, in Korean, bandipun or firefly, 
which has a original uh, uh, sending out the light based on the chemical reactions. So that you can use as a reporter, especially this is good for the, the gene of interest is actually deep inside tissue, then you can, it's sometimes hard to observe from the outside. So firefly, firefly protein or sometimes Gaussian protein. So these are like found in sea creatures. And so this bioluminescence can be used. Okay, that is an, by enzyme called luciferase. So these are enzymes. So I give you the example. So this slide was like a little bit um, not shown. So I update, I put an updated one. Uh, so the first example is GLP and you're interested in the uh, interesting gene. And by watching the expression of GLP, you know that this gene is being uh, uh, expressed. The other aspect is a lock G gene. And this study, you see this a, a heterozygous of SATD2 gene and uh, it's a homozygous uh, knockout. So you can see some of these differences. And this is based on the lock gene as a reporter for the specific genes. And the luciferase case is, um, you see, you probably can see this one in this case. Uh, I'm interested in some expression of genes in, in the body distribution. Then what happens is this adenovirus, uh, so infected area, or for example, some cells, specific cells, they will, uh, they will generate luciferase enzyme. And that's expressed and inside the cell, sometimes they can secrete. And you want to find it. How do you do it? Uh, one way is you just inject enzyme substrate by IV injection. Then it, it circulates the body. When it hits these luciferase enzyme, it emits light. So very cool uh, and sensitive ways. A cool thing about this compared to fluorescent protein is fluorescent protein, you can see only near the surface. While luciferase, you don't have to send the light deep inside the tissue, but the light's coming out. So while the resolutions are poorer, but you can actually detect uh, uh, this uh, um, gene expression happening or the target uh, from deep inside the tissue. So this is a, a good way of uh, reporter gene. Okay, so now I'm gonna go to visualizing neural circuitry. So the importance of in neurons compared to other cells in our body is the neuron never function alone, okay? Neurons are all connected. So, so the neuron function in the brain is governed by its unique combination of the neuron is a kind of a, a, an entity which we call input and output, okay? So that it forms a neural uh, circuit to which it belongs. So how to specifically study neurons, direct and indirect connections with the other neurons in the nervous system? So that's a question, uh, and we call this as a neural circuitry, and how to visualize them is an important aspect. So for this, uh, I introduce you a tracers uh, concept here. So for example, um, you know, when we try to find our connections uh, of the neuron, you somehow need to give some contrast so that you can actually find the connection. So here, AAV, uh, a popular way of this is uh, called adeno-associated uh, associative virus, which is even used uh, popular for gene therapy in even clinical trial. So for example, you can see inject here, this neuron, then it, you know, neurons are like kind of connected. So you can find out these connections uh, from uh, top to bottom and this, like all these three dimensional way. So there are two concepts. Enterograde is a, you inject the virus and the virus will infect the neuronal cell body. And, uh, but you know, in neuron, they always transport uh, molecules, proteins and organelles uh, along the axon. So it will go to the other part, uh, which is connected distal part. So side of injection, and this start if the 
the transfer is coming from the cell body to the distal, we call enteric rays. Then you can think of the other ways. Hey, you are injecting this virus, uh, and then it may go back to the original cell body. So this is also you can consider a way that it's called a retrograde. So enterograde tracers show um, two ways. I have to define if it's coming out, we call efferent, come getting in, afferent. Okay, let's see. Uh, uh, yes, enterograde tracers show efferent or afferent, first or second. Efferent. Exactly, because it's a, from the side it goes up. So efferent projection, we call it this as a projection. Now retrograde tra tracers show now. Yes, afferent pro projections. Okay, so the neuronal tracer is now, it's a chemical probe which labeled the axon path. So this path to illuminate, Jibom, uh, I think you can answer this, the ton T in the nervous system. As you see, uh, which part of the neurons are actually connected to each other. Yeah, we are talking about how they are connected. So this is called connectivity in the nervous system. Okay, so, so um, this direction-based description of tracer I already told, uh, explained, so I think it's easy now. Transport from the cell body, okay? because most of these organelles and materials are transported, made from cell body along to the axon to until the, the end of this is presynaptic terminal, okay? An enterograde tracer should be present in the cell bodies, uh, presynaptic terminals of the injected uh, neurons. So now we talk about retrograde is we are talking about the backwards a transport. So transport from the synaptic, you see, terminal back to the cell body. A retrograde tracer so should present in the cell bodies of neurons that project to the injection site. And I hope this uh, makes sense to you guys, uh, enterograde and retrograde. And so what are those examples? So this is a little bit of a list, so I don't expect you to memorize all of this, but just to get to know once would be enough for now. So tracers can be fluorescent or produce a you know, color forming. So it's called colorimetric product that can be visualized by microscopy. So there are like these tracer examples, enterograde, PHA-L, which is called plant lectin uh, for electron microscope. Retrograde, pulse reddish peroxidase or fluorescent microspheres can be used. And this fluorobolt, uh, I won't get into much. And retro and both enterograde, both directions are possible by DII, and DIO, so this is a dye pattern. And BDA, which is biotimulated dextran amine. And what's more interesting here is sometimes, you know, neural circuitry is not only formed as a one single neuron because it has connection, connection, and multiple. So sometimes you may, be, you may want to check actually how does this actually goes to downstream of neurons. So that we need a transsynaptic uh, tracers. Okay, so tritiated amino acids, weak drug, weak term, agglutinin, tetanus toxin, fragment C, pseudo revised virus, and I, I hope you know revised virus, uh, Korean Gwangyeonbyo. And that revised virus is uh, uh, you know, famous for they actually trans, they pass through neurons, so transsynaptic or you guys know herpes simplex virus, um, uh, HSV is also transsynaptic. 
So the use of virus is actually quite uh, popular because virus is very effective to deliver genetically encoded proteins such as green fluorescent protein to a brain region of interest for use as on from that injection site to the downstream so enterograde tracers. As the fluorescent will fill the soma or cell body first and they will diffuse down to the length of the axon so that it reveals the connective. But it takes time, okay? So it's not like right away, one day procedure. So once you inject the virus, you need a like waiting period and so that, you know, this enterograde uh, tracer will fill and then you can brain remover process and examine for the presence of the tracer. It can be, you know, a week, it can be several weeks. Okay, so I just give you some more information here and uh, transsynaptic labeling uh, agents, I think. Um, the, the functional brain circuit, it can connect with the primary, secondary, tertiary, reordered uh, neurons. So transsynaptic tracers is can cross synapses and they can label multiple neurons in a Yeah, circuit, right? Uh, so very sensitive ones are radioactive, while maybe not, not all of us are likely to use the radioactive amino acid can be very sensitive. So tritiated, uh, tri tritium H is pro uh, used for proline or label for leucine, which is an amino acid. So for this, uh, we use for enterograde transsynaptic labeling. And some of these amino acids are uptaken by cells by amino acid transporters, uh, which is incorporated into proteins, then the neuron will reveal this. Because neurons are very active, uh, always very active. Okay, then some protein are shuttered down exons by endogenous. Uh, of course, enterograde transport, the neuron, the protein was made in the cell body, soma, and then they can shuttle down uh, axon, and that can be actually a reveal. That's, and some proteins are even secreted at the synaptic terminal and received by a second order neuron. Of course, the effectiveness will be down, uh, but you know, it's very sensitive, so they can be detached using uh, this, type of the uh, image, which is called autoradiography, which is, a, this is a picture, but produced by radiation from radioactive material uh, of the object. And, and the second, a popular transsynaptic labeling agent is a plant lectin. And lectin is a protein that exhibits extremely high binding affinity for specific sugar uh, molecules. Some plant lectins have some plant lectin have affinities for specific, you know, sugar is, uh, in other words, it's called glyco, okay? glycoproteins on neuronal plasma membrane. So these can be used as a uh, transsynaptic. So like WGA, DTX, these are toxin, can also be transported crossing the synapses. Okay, but this is like injection of tracers, but you know, sometimes now uh, transgenic animals can be created, which express transneuronal lectin tracers under the control of neuronal, neuron specific promoters to examine, then you can do cell type specific neural, neuronal circuits. And the last one is the uh, transgenic labeling as a virus, which is we are make use of the ability of virus which naturally invade or infect, we know that, or coronavirus, right? Infect the neurons and produce infectious progeny, like, you know, virus particle. Uh, the, you know, the useful aspects of the virus may be bad for us for coronavirus, but virus is self-amplifying trans, tracers, okay? that progressively label neuron in a circuit as they become infected and some can cross synaptic junction. So 
we remember some tracers, for example, microbes who are, which are fluorescent, you inject. If they will be downstream, then you know, the concentration will be down and down. But the virus is amplifying itself. So you know, it has an advantage for that. So common viruses for transneuronal circuits are, as I said, uh, not the true, but pseudo revised virus, which is known to be transsynaptic and herpes simplex virus. In Korean, it's a desang cogen. So these are like many portions of us already have it, but it only will like outbreak when our immune systems are, are bad. So some people in their like later life or middle age with a, under a lot of stress can actually have this uh, herpes. Okay, however, we have to also think of what are the problems of this limitation of virus as transsynaptic tracer. Okay. Yeah, the virus can kill, you know, it, it makes a lot of progeny particle. It can kill that neuron. Okay, so it's, it may lead to generalized infection of the animal. Of course, yeah, you have to be careful for that. So uh, conclusion, we, we have talked about organization and structure of the nervous system, which provide first clues about the function and how particular structure or process of cells give rise to eventually behavior. So this is, we are talking about this structure of the nervous system even down to a cellular or synapse level, and you can try to link to uh, the behavior. So for that, we need to have a lot of techniques, so methods of tissue preparation, how to fix the tissue, and how to investigate the morphology, which gives us a snapshot of spatial distribution of this uh, gene expression, and that gene expression pattern and ultimately forming the neuronal or neural circuitry. And we can actually study those connectivity of the cell. Uh, with that, uh, today we talk gene and protein expression, how to visualize them. So this is more a technical aspect. And also even neural circuitry can be visualized by enterograde and retrograde tracers and even transsynaptic labeling. And next week we will be talking about neural uh, functions.